Welcome to the Diablo 3 Reaper of Souls preview panel. Your panelists are Josh Mosquera, Kevin Martins, Stephen Wong, Jesse McCree, Joe Shelley, Julian Love, Tim Lin, and Zavin Harutunian. How you guys doing? Are you guys ready to face death? Awesome. So am I. Isn't that cinematic? Just awesome. It's me really psyched to be here. Uh, my name is Josh Mosquera. I'm the game director, and I'm, it's a great honor to be here with you guys today to show you some of the cool new things we have in store for you guys for Reaper of Souls. We have a great panel for you guys today. But before we get into the meat and potatoes of Reaper Souls, I want to take a few moments to talk to you guys about what Reaper Souls means to us. What are some of our high level goals we had when we started the project? And for us, it all starts with epic heroes. Where you're the barbarian, or the demon hunter, or the monk, or the brand new crusader, your knight in battle scarred armor, you guys are playing heroes that are bigger than life, and you're facing the forces of darkness. In Reaper Souls, we're celebrating the dark, gothic heart that is at the root of Diablo. And we have a slew of new monsters for you guys to kill and loot. And Joe and Julian up here are going to talk to you guys about how our monsters are designed. They live to die. But we're not, not only introducing new monsters, we're introducing a brand new villain to the world of Diablo in the form of Malfail, the Angel of Death, and Tim and Zavin are going to talk to you guys about Pandemonium, the final battleground where you guys are going to be confronting Malfail and trying to stop death. But we're not just stopping there. One of the most important goals for us is we wanted to make sure that there was a, an end game for everyone. We wanted to make sure that you guys had as many different options when it comes to how you play Diablo 3. So not only are you going to have a great story mode, where you're going to see the story of Act 5, the fall of Westmarch, and defeating Malthale, but we're also introducing a brand new way to play Diablo 3. We're introducing Adventure Mode. And to do that, I want to ask Kevin Martins, our lead game designer, to come on stage and talk to you guys about Adventure Mode. Hello, BlizzCon. It's nice to have you all back in beautiful Southern California. So, who's had a chance to play Adventure Mode on the demo floor today? Okay, so those of you who've had a chance to play it, um, I'm glad you have, and you're still going to learn a lot about how and why we made it. So, what problem were we trying to solve? Adventure Mode started, basically, um, as some core elements of the game that weren't working well together. So, ultimately, Diablo is about getting awesome loot and killing monsters to do that. And we have these two things in the game that weren't working well together. On one hand, We've got this big, big world of Sanctuary. Um, and we had it split up into four acts, basically. So each of the acts were self-contained. They had cool villains at the end of them. And we had this campaign mode. Uh, and that was good. Um, but we also had you play through it four times in a row to sort of get to level 60 or to what the end game was. So on the other hand, we also have this big, complex randomization system. We have all of this content, and we have this game with these random tile sets and monster distribution that's random. Um, and those two things didn't work well together. Playing that campaign over and over again um, and not taking advantage of that randomness was something that we wanted to make a lot better. So we put this core stake in the ground, which was go anywhere, slay anything. So under this idea, this is sort of how the beginning of Adventure Mode happened, how the genesis of this feature began. So imagine a world where you can start in the festering woods and do one of your favorite little side dungeons, have a good reason to do that, have that be richly rewarded. Then go do a boss in Act 3, here's Gom in the keep. Then go to heaven, have again a good reason to go there, have this epic awesome zone and want to go there and be able to do that freely in one session without having to go out of the game to get back into the game again. So that's ultimately what Adventure Mode is. This is a brand new game mode. 
So that uh, requirement that you play through the game linearly, that's gone. You can play when you want to. Not only, thank you. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, end game for everyone that Josh mentioned, not only is adventure mode uh, an end game, it's also somewhere where you can level up your character. So we have this awesome new campaign in Act 5, um, but you don't have to play that in order to get to adventure mode. Adventure mode is this new mode. You can play where you want to. So a lot of you are probably already familiar with this request because you've made it yourselves. Why don't we just unlock all the waypoints? So we went way beyond that. So this is a new map of Act 3. You can go to any act, you can go to any waypoint in it at any time. You can jump all over the game, up to and including Act 5. So Adventure Mode, again, is a separate mode from the campaign mode. That said, we've taken all of our favorite moments from the campaign, all of those story battles that you enjoyed, all the little side scenes, all of the events and the random parts as well, and we've combined them together into an Adventure Mode. Um, so the story, essentially the quest, just gets out of the way, but it's still freely playable. Your character can go back and forth between the modes at any time. So the two features that Adventure Mode boils down to, the way that we deliver this to you, are bounties and Nephilim Rifts. These are the sub-features of Adventure Mode. Bounties essentially are very simple. These are the tour guide through that world. You now can go anywhere. Bounties are the way that we suggest where you should go. So Steven's going to go through this in a lot more detail in just a moment, but essentially all our favorite parts of the game are given to you and it's a rewarding way to play. Variety has become the most rewarding way to play. And then Nephilim Rifts. Nephilim Rifts are that promise of that randomization that we do. All those tile sets, all these monsters, all these technical systems to make the game as replayable as possible. This is um, that replayability writ on an epic scale. This particular example, here's Act 4 and Act 3 monsters fighting together in Whimsyshire. Notice the rainbows and everything. I like to call this Grimsyshire because it's dark and it's night. Um, no one laughed at that at the office either. Um, this particular uh, image um, shows also that we have random leather and lighting, or weather and lighting everywhere as well, and that includes the hubs. So you get to go see Chaldeum at night and other areas too. So that might seem like a minor thing from a feature point of view, but it does make everything feel better as well. So to go in a lot more detail on bounties, here's Stephen Wong. So as Kevin just mentioned to you, we, we opened up the world, we opened up all acts and all waypoints at once, but it wasn't quite enough. Uh, when we were playing with it internally, we had some problems. Single player, some people wanted to have a little bit more guidance. Uh, they were overwhelmed by all the different options that were now available to them. And in multiplayer, uh, a lot of times the party would get separated because there wasn't any one goal keeping the party together. So you'd have four different players off in their own corner of the world. So what we decided to do was bounties. And what bounties are, are random quests that are given to you at the start of the game, and they take place in all five acts, and they take advantage of all the different content that's inside of Diablo 3 and Reaper of Souls. Uh, bounties will take you through all the bosses, all the events, all the side dungeons, Everything that we've put into the game, now we put a focus onto that with bounties in adventure mode. <clears throat> so at the start of an adventure mode game, you'll get 25 random bounties, five in each act, that you can, go and you can go and complete. Now, we're not putting the game on rails. You can still do everything else inside of adventure mode. You can go wherever you want to, but if you opt into this, then you can go and do these bounties and collect your rewards afterwards. So let's take a look at some of the different bounty types we have. Uh, the first bounty type is killing a boss, right? So we've taken all 15 act bosses that are in Yellow 3 and Reaper of Souls, and we've made a bounty for each one. And in this example, you're going to go kill Queen Aranya in the spider caves. So you'll find the entrance to the spider caves, go inside, slay your way through to the queen's chamber, and destroy her, and you'll collect your reward. The next type of bounty that we have is completing an event. And in this example, it's in the Festering Woods, and you will go and complete the last stand of the Ancients quest that's inside of the Festering Woods and complete your reward. And this lets us put the spotlight on a lot of the different events that we have in the game that might be a little bit out of the way of normal gameplay, but now with a bounty quest for them, you'll go and find them and do them, and it'll add a lot of diversity and randomness to the game. 
Our third type of bounty is killing a unique monster. And in this example, we have a bounty for killing Mira Eamon, the blacksmith's undead wife. And you might remember her from story mode, where you'll go into the blacksmith cellar and take care of her because the blacksmith needs you to do this, and that's how you advance the story in the game. But what we've, what we've done in adventure mode is we've moved her out of the cellar into random distribution in the festering woods, and you'll go out, explore, find her, and kill her, and you'll collect a reward after that. And what we've done is we've taken a lot of the uniques that are in the game, uniques like Mira or Jondar, and we've put them into random distribution, and they're now bounty targets. Our last kind of bounty is clearing a dungeon. And this is our version of Diablo II's Den of Evil. And in this example, you'll go to the Khazar Den in Fields of Mystery, and you'll lay waste all the things. And you'll collect your reward afterwards. And what this kind of bounty lets us do is take you through all the different kind of side dungeons that we have that, again, may be off the beaten path right now, but because there's a bounty, you're going to go do them, and you, know, you get experience, all that content that we've built for you. So I've mentioned reward a lot, and let's, let's take a look at what you're going to get by doing bounties. So you're going to get golden experience, of course, and we want to make it you know, worthwhile for you to be doing these things, right? Like, it should be you know, pretty good reward for you to be doing bounties, right? Uh, you're also going to get access to powerful items. And lastly, you're going to get rift keystones. And to talk about what rift keystones are and what they open, here's Jesse McCree. Hello, BlizzCon. I'm super excited to be here to talk to you about Nephilim Rifts. Um, previously, we referred to these as loot runs. And what they are are randomized dungeons. So what we've done is we've taken all of the tile sets, all of the dungeons in the game, and we've organized them in new and interesting ways. So we've taken um, the cathedral, all the exteriors, and all the monsters and shuffled them up. So every time you do one of these, it's random. Um, since they're self-contained areas that you go into, we can do things in them we wouldn't normally do in the campaign mode. For example, we'll do combinations of monsters that you wouldn't normally see. We'll take monsters from different acts and we'll put them together. We'll take multiple types of summoner and put them together so you can get quickly overwhelmed if you don't deal with those threats. Um, we'll play with monster density. So this is the place where things can get a little out of hand and every time you go in, the monsters randomize, the number of monsters randomize, so every floor can be different. Some will be a little sparse, some can get really out of hand, for example, the picture behind me. Um, so, like I mentioned, they're randomized dungeons, and what we've done is these are one to ten level deep dungeons. In the game right now, um, the deepest we go is two levels, so every time you transition from one level to another, uh, it can be a different dungeon and it'll have a different combination of monsters and we'll mix up the type of dungeon you're going through. For example, we'll start in a cathedral, we can go into a root cave after that, go to a crypt, or you could have one level that's just a big exterior zone. Or you can go from exterior into um, a Zoltan Cool dungeon or something like that. So there's all kinds of different um, ways we put these together, and every time you do them, it's different. So, like I mentioned, these are self-contained, and we can do things that we wouldn't do in the campaign mode, like give you crazy buffs. So in the, in the exterior world, we'll give you little buffs, but in Nephilim Rifts, we'll do things like give you AoE lightning that'll one-shot everything. We will give you uh, no-cast cooldown or invulnerability, and that really helps when you come across some of these really crazy populations that are hard to deal with. Um, you get some really exciting kind of uh, buffs happening. Now to cap off every Nephilim Rift, we have a boss, and what we've done is instead of fighting them in an arena, we actually spawn them in the dungeon with you and this is more similar to D2, so you'll have to deal with the monsters that are in the dungeon as well as the boss that spawns. And these are random bosses. We've taken the, the existing ones and we've created new ones and we've randomized their powers and abilities. Um, and what I'd like to do now is show you a quick video of some Nephilim Rifts in action that you're going to play with the Crusader.
So since it's a new expansion, we have a lot of new monsters. And what I'd like to do now is bring up Joe Shelley to start talking to you about those. All right. So we've seen some new stuff from Adventure Mode. And now I'm going to talk to you about some of the new monsters we've got in Reaper of Souls. Um, so let's start in Westmarch. In Westmarch, we've got the Angel of Death coming into a city and wiping out all its inhabitants. It's been laid siege to. And so we want to have monsters that tell that story by their design, by what they look like, and what they do. So first off, we've got the Summoner. Now this is a, a monster that stands in the crossroads of city streets, defiles the ground under it, and raises ghosts up out of the cobblestones. Nathales also sent in his Death Maidens. Now these are his lieutenants. They have wield their giant scythes, cut the heads off the Westmarch to gift defenders, uh, and reincarnate them as ghosts and skeletons to fight the player. Now we've got the Punisher. This is the heavy shock troop of Malthale's army. He leaps onto the screen, stuns enemies around his area of arrival, and beats his fists together, smashing them and doing tremendous damage. These guys all work together to tell the story of a place that's been invaded and overrun. And when the player enters, they're going to need to beat back these forces. Let's take a look at the player doing that just now. <laughs> Pretty cool. Um, so now we're going to take a look at some of my favorite monsters. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of sneak peek. I'm going to show you some guys from the Blood March, one of the other zones. Uh, you can see here some of the concept art for the Boggan Trapper and the Brute, which I'm going to talk about. Uh, but we're going to start with the Boggan. Now this little guy, he, he's my favorite. He rolls around, he's a little bit cute, he lives underground, and you're going to see a ton of these guys there. Uh, and he's part of a family. Um, you might remember the Fallen uh, from Act 1. Well, the Blood Marsh has a family as well. Uh, the next member of it is the Boggan Trapper. Uh, he actually goes out and hunts. He throws bear traps on the ground to slow his prey, and he fires a little blow dart uh, to incapacitate them. Uh, and then we'll look at the Boggan Brute. Now this is the king of the Blood Marsh. He goes where he pleases, he kicks the other enemies out of the way, um, the little Boggets feel his wrath on the regular. Uh, and when we put these guys together, we've got a place that really comes to life and feels like a real world environment. Let's take a look here. <laughs> guys are persistent. <laughs> so when we create a monster, we think about several different things. We talk about how they come onto the screen, how they spawn, what they do, and how they die. And we're going to get into how they die and, 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 and what they do in a minute. But I want to talk a little bit about how they're introduced. And we had a particular dungeon called the Catacombs, which is a little bit later in the expansion. And we really wanted to create a feeling in the player of a deep, dark area that's foreboding, you get a sense of dread, and you never know what's going to be around the corner. So we took this little guy called the Scarab, and we said, well, could we just make him crawl out of everywhere? So you, just, you never know where he's going to show up, and just put a ton of these guys in there. Uh, you can see here the player wandering in. There's just a few of them at the start. But pretty soon, pretty soon there are a lot. That's 
a lot of guys. Now, what you may... Thanks. <laughs> what you may not have noticed there is the player actually walks through the scarabs. Um, this is new technology that we got to allow us to put a tremendous number of guys on screen without making the player get bound up and stuck, you know, colliding with them. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. So to talk a little bit more about some of these guys and some of their behaviors, I'm going to bring up Julian Love, our lead technical artist. That was a lot of scarabs, but was it enough? Or should we turn it up a little bit? Uh, uh. All right, BlizzCon has spoken. So we're, we're talking about our design philosophy, you know, how we think about monsters when we're putting them in the game, looked, about, looked a little bit how we do some spawns. The next big subject for us is what they're gonna do, you know? And in a game like Diablo, Monsters really live to die. That's what they're born for. That's what they're there for. And, you know, you're cleaning their clocks at a pretty regular rate, so they tend to not live very long either. So when we focus on what they're going to do, we have to make sure that we're going to do things that are really clear and simple. And we're also looking for things that are going to be memorable. We want behaviors that you can understand. Okay? And we're looking for things that are going to change the way you play and sometimes make you just feel a little differently about that monster. So, in the live game right now, we have a bunch of monsters, ranged monsters, that uh, have this ability to back off from you. And so let's look at how that works right now with these archers. When they want to back off from you, they have to turn around and put their backs to the player and they reposition themselves, and they turn back around, and they pick up their bows, and it makes them feel a little dumb, it makes them a little less threatening. It also means that they kind of don't re really respect you as a player. I mean, they're turning their backs to you. How big of a threat are you, right? So we decided we, we could make an improvement here, and we've got a new capability that we call the back pedal. So looking at these same archers, as the player approaches them, they want to back off, but now they can just back up without changing direction. They maintain their eyesight, is focused on the player, they're respecting the player, and they're a lot more threatening. It's an example of a really simple change that also affects how you feel about that monster. Now I want to head over to the Blood Marsh again and take a closer look at the Brute and Boggets. So a lot of monsters in the game can summon guys and throw them at you. But the Brute literally does this. When he summons Boggets onto the field, he immediately throws them right at you. This makes him really aggressive as a summoner, which is usually not the case. But it also underscores the savage relationship between Brutes and Boggets, which is a great reflection of life in the Blood Marsh. And we really like the fact that they're interacting. This is really something different for us, so we thought maybe there's an opportunity to do more with that idea. So I'd like to introduce the Terror Bat. Now the Terror Bat has a really cool behavior. He can pick up Boggets, raise them into the air, give them a rabid bite, and transform them into Brutes. And the Brutes can then spawn more Boggets. Boggets can get turned back into Brutes by Bats. <laughs> this has a real interesting effect on gameplay. It creates a vicious circle. When you walk on screen and you see, oh, hey, there's a brute right there. I gotta worry about that brute. But then here comes a bat. Uh-oh, what's gonna happen? He's gonna make more brutes. He's gonna make more pockets. You gotta manage that stuff right away. <laughs> because we love you. All right, this is my favorite part, how they die. I think a lot about how monsters die, not just because we're weird, um, well, maybe some of us. Um, we, it's really important in a game where monsters live to die, death becomes really critical, in fact. Uh, it's the culmination of your effort. It's what you're doing, you know, right? It's what they're there for. It's when you get your loot, right? It's really important. And the thing I think that 
is easy to miss is that it's a great opportunity to tell some story, either about that monster or about something in the world that's going on, uh, or even it's a great opportunity to draw the player further into the game world. And I have an example of that in the Realm Walker. Now the Realm Walker is a giant beast that you can find in the uh, Forgotten Battlefields. And he's guarding a portal that he carries around on his head. And he uses that portal as a weapon against the player by spawning in monsters from another realm. And uh, spoiler alert here, you get to kill him, right? And when you do, he's just gonna overload and a bunch of energy and explode because we like to blow things up. And he loses control of that portal and you can jump into it and then go to that realm where those monsters were coming from. Really big spiders. <laughs> okay, here's another example from the Blood Marsh. We looked at trappers earlier, but what you might not have realized is like what a bunch of jerks these guys are. Here they are, they're in this guard tower, they're all holed up, they're super confident, they're drop dropping traps on you, they're peppering you with darts. Uh, they think they've got it made. It's not really the case. You're gonna take them out, you're gonna deliver some justice to these guys but not any kind of justice will do. We want some poetic justice for something like this, right? So when you take the power down, they get dismembered by their own traps in a giant bloody mess. Let's watch that. Yeah. Okay, the last thing I wanna focus on today is how important it is that we make monsters that you can understand. We want monsters that you can relate to. It makes them so much more interesting to kill when you can understand them and you know what they are. So I've got some examples of some behaviors that we give monsters to help you understand them. And here is a great rag to riches story in a monster that we call the Exorcist. You can find this guy in Westmarch. He's one of Mount Thale's crew. Now, when we first started working on this guy, we got this idea, well, what if he just dropped like a bunch of evil stuff on the ground that would chase you, and your thing, your job was run away from it. And it worked okay, but we think if you're gonna run away from something in a Diablo game, you should understand what it is. It should be familiar to you. You should get it. You should see why it's dangerous. And this just wasn't hitting it. It was just too abstract. So we took this guy back to the drawing board. Let's give him some new abilities, something that you can really get. So now he charges himself up into a being of ultimate lightning power and blasts you with lightning energy. And the reason why this works so much better is because you can completely get this idea of this guy, he's bristling with energy, you get that dark skeleton in there, which is a Diablo kind of thing, right? And then the lightning is something that everybody understands. That's a monster that might be worth your time, might be worth running away from. All right. So here we have the West March Hound, another monster that you can find in your souls. <laughs> yeah, you looked at him and he looks like a bulldog, so what should he do, right? He should do things like a bulldog does. And they like to chew on stuff, right? So we thought, well, what if he treats the player like a chew toy? And when he gets done with you, you're like covered in dog slobber and it's really gross. But here's the thing. That's not the only dog behavior we thought of. Let's see what happens when the West March Hound kills the player. Oh my god, we gotta see that again. One more time. <laughs> so humiliating. All right, that wraps up our look at Monsters for Reaper of Souls, and now I'm gonna kick it back over to Kevin Martins, who's gonna bring us all up to speed with a new area called Pandemonium. All right, so it's very hard to top that, so let's just switch gears completely. Um, what we love to do at BlizzCon specifically that we don't do anywhere else is talk a lot about philosophy, about why we make the decisions we do, and about our process, how do we make things. So, 
Um, we want to show you a lot about pandemonium and reveal the zone, but let's talk about how we make areas using pandemonium as the example for a second. So we have to ask ourselves a few questions, um, like just like when we're making a monster. For areas, the most important one is what is the fantasy? Why is it awesome just to walk around in this zone? If you saw a screenshot or a clip of the video, you'd be like, I want to play there. With pandemonium, it's fairly obvious. If you don't already know what this is, pandemonium is the eternal battlefield. This is where the angels and demons fought their eternal conflict. At different times, this chaotic, ever-changing area, it's been held by the demons, it's been held by the angels. It has elements of both, and it's this place that sort of is beyond human understanding. The races that inhabit it are not humans, and they don't work like humans. That's a very interesting thing in and of itself. You can tell that we wanted to take you here for a long time because we keep showing it to you. If you remember, in the Diablo opening cinematic, the angels are pouring down onto the forgotten battlefield. The demons are coming up, they're holding it right now, and like, yeah, let's go there and kill things like that, right? And we also had this teaser piece called Wrath, which we did about a month before Diablo came out. Same thing, again, angels and demons fighting in that battlefield. So it's been years that we've wanted to go there, and finally we have a chance to do that. Um, why we waited so long is that we have this, this idea that, especially in expansions which are more self-contained than the bigger game like Diablo 3 was, you want the villain and the area to fit really well together and the player to have a good reason to go there. Um, so Pandemonium is a great fit for a number of reasons. Um, but the second question we have to, to wonder is where does the a zone fit into the game? So there's a few different things by, like what we mean by that, and one of them is literally where does it fit, like what zones are before it and after it. In this case, the story and its placement meant a couple of things that were really important. We began in Westmarch. Westmarch was a big bang opening. Um, death comes down to Sanctuary and wipes out the most powerful city that's left on Sanctuary in nearly an instant, and you, the player, have to go and stop them. It's really hard to trump that. So we had to find some way that in this rising action of the expansion, that somehow Pandemonium felt grander and bigger than that. So it was the end zone, of course. And it's not just the end as in it's the final zone, but it's the end of humanity if you don't succeed. Um, Malthael is here. This is this place that he's familiar with. It's his territory, and this matters for a few different reasons. This place is beyond humanity. It doesn't matter how crazy we things got on Sanctuary. What happens on Pandemonium can be even crazier. Again, that eternal battle that happened there and all that, that war stuff that other races other than you have done, that's what can make this interesting no matter how big and grand we've made Westmarch. So the fact that Malthael is here um, matters a lot as well. Um, when, he was, uh, when, when the battle ended, and we call this the Forgotten Battlefields now, the eternal conflict moved to Sanctuary, and it sort of became this guerrilla conflict where humanity was caught in the middle and angels and demons were fighting on Earth. So Malthael, um, he was the leader of the angels at the time, and he saw this happen. He saw humanity, something that he thinks is an abomination that shouldn't exist. Humans are a combination of angels and demons, and now he's seen this enormous capacity for power that you, the player, have shown. You guys defeated the prime evil, something that he's never been able to do in the eons of battle league that he's done. He's also seen characters like Zoltan Cool, these incredibly powerful humans who choose to do evil. So ultimately, his solution, at the time he was the angel of wisdom, he became death, and he's going to wipe out humanity so that he can wipe all remaining traces of demonic essence out of the world and supposedly live in a world where there's only angels left. So he's here, and if you don't stop him, he's nearly already succeeded by the time the game has begun. So it's, it's a very intense zone, and that's how we were able to trump Westmarch, which we also made as intense as possible. So keep this backstory in mind and this intense of having this zone end the game, and we're going to run you through exactly how we made the game. So, Tim? All right. Thank you, Kevin. So before we started working on the Forgotten Battlefields, the first thing we did is we had a brainstorm with the artists. And so I'm going to show you a few of those brainstorms now. This first one, what we really liked about it is we liked the dark atmosphere that it had, and we liked the idea of this river of souls flowing from this dark, sinister-looking orb. All right, this next one, this is a throne room at the core of Pandemonium. We really thought that this image did a great job of depicting the nexus between heaven and hell. All right, we like the otherworldly feeling of this shot. One challenge that we have on Diablo, though, is sometimes feel, things feel a little bit too futuristic. 
Though we thought on this shot that the massive stone, floating, war-torn structures really helped ground the image. All right, this one is a much more traditional rendering of a battlefield with ancient titans in the background. We knew, though, that if we added these giant remains to the battlefield, it would really give the environment a sense of epic scale. All right, okay, this is one of the prototypes that we do. These are, these are awesome. These are fantastic because they allow us to add monsters to them. They allow us to add lighting and quickly look at when we're building a level. If you look close, you can see that this one was kit bashed together in about a day with uh, existing Zoltan Pool art assets. We like this one because we, we felt it kind of felt like a building graveyard. All right, now we've warped. We've warped way ahead to the first shot you're going to see of Pandemonium. This is where you're going to start your journey. As you can see, we took some things from the brainstorm. We took the floating ideas, we took the otherworldly ideas, and we added it to the level. All right, now we've reached the heart of the level. You can see that we've added some, some primitive angelic architecture up in the left-hand corner surrounding one of our new hazards for the zone. So Ivan's going to talk about that in a second. Okay, so the level is, is slowly ripping apart. It's been ripping apart over the eons. Um, if you look close, when this video starts again, you're going to see that we've added the, the dead demons, the huge petrified demons to the edges of the level. Give it that epic sense of scale. All right, now we've reached the climax of the level. The fortress walls, the entrance is in front of us now. Malthale's domain is behind those walls. And this is where you're going to have to fight your way in. So fight. Now we're going to give it to Zavin to talk about the gameplay in the level. Thanks, Tim. OK, so when we first started building our exterior zones in Reaper of Souls, we knew we wanted to make some changes compared to how we did them in Acts 1 through 4. Now, the exteriors uh, in those acts are fairly fixed. They're very static. The interiors are slightly randomized. And uh, we really wanted to change that up for Reaper of Souls. So to that end, we've made fully randomized exteriors, and Pandemonium is one of those. Um, so as you can see here, these are just, yeah. So these are just uh, you know, basic renderings of the mini-maps uh, of the entire level. Um, you can see that the location of start and exit completely different between the two. The shapes are very different. Uh, we actually have the interiors of the zone also fully randomized, all of them, not just little bits and pieces. We got these nice organic edges that are, again, fully randomized every time you play. Uh, and we also uh, completely randomized direction and flow through the zone. So that means every time you play the zone, whether it's in ow, whether it's in story mode or adventure mode or even uh, Nephilim Rifts, the zone is random every single time you play. And inside this random zone, you guys have already seen our, uh, our uh, realm walkers. We have a few other treats in here. We have abandoned garrisons. These are ancient fortresses the angels built to ward off the demons. And inside, these are abandoned, so the monsters that have taken over are not necessarily what you'd expect. They're not angels or demons. They're a completely other type of monster. We also have these battles frozen in time. When the angels controlled this place, they set traps everywhere to just imprison uh, the demon hordes and you know, lessen the numbers that were coming through. But the player can now go in, smash the trap, and kill the, uh, all the demons and get all the loot. You also have deadly hazards just spread all throughout the zone. Uh, this was a very contentious battlefield for heaven and hell. So here the angels have laid traps all throughout to stop the demons, but now you're the bad guy to Malthale, and you're going to have to contend with all of these on the way. So we've seen we've got the fully randomized zone, we've got a whole bunch of cool content inside, and let's see how it all comes together. Let's see the, uh, the zone live in action with some actual gameplay. <coughs>
right, I'm going to pass this back off to Josh. He's going to wrap this up. Thanks, Evan. So what do you guys think? Yeah. We were so excited. We cannot wait for you guys to try it out. You get a sneak peek right now here on the show floor, but really looking forward to you guys getting your hands on Reaper Souls. As you can see, we crammed a lot of features into it. I think there's more features in Reaper Souls than there's loot in the, in the Treasure Goblin. So really looking forward to you guys playing it. And right now, I want to take a few moments to say thank you. You guys are the most awesome fans. You guys help us make the game better. And thank you for coming along on this awesome ride. You were Reaper Souls, the shutting down the auction house with the Crusader, the darker, more gothic Act 5, Adventure Mode, Loot 2.0. We're really excited about what the future has in store for Diablo 3. So thank you guys, and here's a final treat, our gameplay trailer. Spoilers. Apparently we're going to do the Q&A first. <laughs> but maybe we can possibly see the video. Before the q and I just want to let you guys know that we have a very awesome lore panel later on today and tomorrow we're doing a deep dive into a lot of the gameplay systems. We're going to talk about the Crusader, Loot 2.0 and a lot of great new skills. But uh, before we, we get out of here, I'm sure you guys have maybe one or two questions. <laughs> Alright, how are we doing this? <laughs> oh. oh, there we go. How you doing? Um, so, what's going on with the ladder system? Ladders. Ladders are awesome to climb. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit more. Um, they have rungs, <laughs> right? And uh, th the whole point is to get to the top, right? So, stay tuned. <laughs> so, with the closing of the auction house and everybody buying and selling gold, what do you plan on doing to affect the flood of gold that's going to come into the market just before the auction house closes? So I can take this. So the question was, what are we going to do about um, all the gold that's in the economy, essentially? OK. Um, so um, we have a, a number of new gold things coming. And again, the gameplay panel tomorrow is going to go into them very specifically. Um, one of the big ones is enchanting. Uh, Transmogrify is not a major gold sink, but enchanting is the system that allows you to re-roll any uh, spat on your item, essentially, and re-roll it to make it better for yourself. And that's a smart drop roll as well, so it's very likely to be good for your character, and you can see all the potential things you can roll, so that's a major thing. We've got new uh, blacksmith, new and better blacksmith recipes coming, also smart drops, so when they do roll, they're again much more likely to be better, things like that. And that, those are just a couple of the, of the big features for gold sinks. So we do intend to find ways to get some gold out of the economy. Um, and the balance that we have to do is we don't want to make it so that if you're not already one of the people with 40 billion gold, that for some reason you can't participate in that. Just people with 40 billion can probably, you know, they pull the slot machine a little more often. Um, but ultimately, gold is not going to be as big of a delta factor for character power as it has been when the auction house was live. Um, so first of all, awesome. 
thank you so much. You guys are breathing new life into this. It, it sounds amazing. Um, my question, though, is so you now have this full open adventure mode. Are all the previous areas going to be uh, designed like those maps that you brought up prior? Um, all acts will be available through adventure mode. So every act is going to have a map just like the one you saw for Act 3. And it'll be all waypoints opened up for you to just bounce around. I think uh, when you guys get into uh, Nephilim Rifts, that's really where we you know, full, full, full throttle on the whole randomization. So the layouts are going to be totally different. That's really where we left the awesome engine we have. Uh, hi, thanks. Uh, I actually enjoy the game, but I've had one issue. No offline mode. When are we going to get it? No offline mode. Awesome. All right. Um, so here's the thing. When we decided to design Diablo 3, we feel, and seeing all of you out here, and this is testament to that, that Diablo plays best when you're playing with your friends, when you have access to this awesome community that is Blizzard. Right? This is why we have BlizzCon. And we felt it was really important for us to have that social connection, for you to be able to have access to your friends list. It also allowed us to make sure your characters are always stored and it was really important for us to really satisfy that social aspect of the game. So. Uh, in, in fact, we're adding more multiplayer features. So groups and clans were, were teased in the trailer there. So those are coming in as well. Um, and that's a feature that makes being online even better. So um, I think that we can try to make, make that the, the fact that it is always online a more satisfying experience, even more so than the, uh, the rich uh, join and drop co-op that's already out there. Hello. Uh, not so much a question, but I just wanted to say, as a hardcore player, I thought death couldn't get any worse, but that dog, oh my god, that is going to be horrid. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Julian. You are welcome. Can't touch it, right? All right. How you doing? Uh, so, hey, Josh. Hands like this today? Right. So. With the removal of the auction house, I know we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but now in a public forum. With the removal of the auction house, what, if any, sort of um, sanctioned or whatever sort of trading model will or will you not put in place to protect people from everything that happens in sanctuary, not just from evil monsters? Uh, so right now we're still in the process of really figuring out what trading means for Diablo. Obviously there is a social component that we still want to retain, but at the end of the day it, it's kind of fundamental to our loot 2.0 philosophy that we feel that finding items in-game by killing monsters to the, be the most rewarding, the most satisfying, and the best way to get your, your, your hands on those items. Hey, uh, bosses are always typical, uh, typically static, just waiting for you to walk into the room before they part, uh, start fighting. Um, have you thought about making them move around in the hallways, making people really think about they before they get into a big battle? I don't know, Jesse, have we? Hello? All right, so in Nephilim Rifts, that's exactly what happens. Um, when a boss spawns, it is in the level with all the monsters. Um, you have to contend with everything. So if you're fighting a champion pack when one spawns and he's right on your head, you have to deal with all of that. Greetings! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, ah, what are your plans for revamping PvP? Revamping. <laughs> I feel it require that I own the new expansion to do so. <laughs> so, you know, PvP is something that, you know, it, a week doesn't go by without Steven here asking me what are we doing for PvP and it's something we're always talking about and we're really trying to figure out what is the right way to express <coughs> PvP what does it actually mean how can we make it fun and it's something that we have we have hopes for but for Reaper Souls the focus has been on the core gameplay loop the epic heroes against the forces of darkness with a promise of epic loot. So we're starting with the fundamentals. Once we feel we have those really solid, then we can start asking the fun question of how we get you guys fighting each other. Awesome. Let me hear 
about anything. Uh, so you guys added backpedaling to monsters. Uh, what about keyboard turning? What about new keywords, did you say? Keyboard turning. I'm sorry. <laughs> you added backpedaling monsters. What about keyboard turning monsters? Keyboard turning monsters. Just a, sorry, just a fun it's, question. It's echoey up here. I literally can't understand the word. Oh, or turning keyboard. Monsters. Oh, okay. That's an actually question for Steven. <laughs> <laughs> um, are, you, are you talking about input and using the keyboard to control your? We lost them. Okay. Oh. All right. Sorry. We try. Uh, hi. So I had a question about what you're going to be doing about uh, unique items, just like the best loot in the game, because right now it seems like you have a lot of items with cool effects, but it seems like the stats just trump any of those effects. So like when I'm playing something with the cool effect drops, but it's like, oh, this doesn't have my primary stat, this doesn't have enough crit, I'm not going to use it. So right. what are you going to do about like giving us items that have cool effects and that are optimal to use so that we actually want to use them? Right. OK, so um, lots of different things, actually. So just a few of the things we're doing. Once again, we're giving a bunch of examples tomorrow at the gameplay panel. So I'll answer the question anyway. But please come tomorrow, and you can talk directly to the item designers in more detail. Uh, so um, we are narrowing the range on things. So for example, if you could have a hammer that could roll 1 to 500 strength, uh, at the upper tier, that's narrowed to 300 to 500. So even if you got the minimum roll, it's still a pretty decent item. The legendary effects on the new legendaries are all somewhat game-changing. We're trying to give them you know, wacky things they do um, that changes uh, perhaps the way that you change one of your existing um, builds. Uh, we have a uh, Witch Doctor mask, for example, that causes Horrify to not just fear monsters but to root them as well, so you get a major crowd control effect. If as a Witch Doctor you hadn't used Horrify before, you're probably going to want to now. Um, for example, so you know we have a lot of things like that where we're narrowing it, we're smart dropping it so that your primary stat for your character class that finds the item is much more likely to be rolled, and so on and so on. There's probably three or four other smart drop systems we can talk about tomorrow. Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry, my voice. Uh, thanks for so the such the fantastic game. Uh, my question is, at the beginning of the first act, there are so many of the side dungeons that just, uh, sorry, so many of the side dungeons that make, uh, the side dungeons that add variety to the game, but then that tapers off towards the end of the game, almost maybe you ran out of development time or whatever happened. Uh, is there anything that you're going to do to add more of those in, or do you have any additional plans to freshen up the first four acts of the game. Uh, OK, so um, the, basically the question was, um, as you get towards act three and four, the amount of side dungeon density lowers. Um, that's for a couple of reasons. Um, at the end, like especially in act four, um, we really feel that players, at that point, after the big reveal, they just want to get to Diablo. So it, it became a little more narrowed and centered uh, inherently. But we recognize that that's an issue, and that actually is where adventure mode comes in. Uh, when we talked about earlier that people were playing the game over and over again, part of it was that you had that goal. You wanted to kill Diablo in your current difficulty level. That was actually encouraging you not to bother with the side dungeons because that slowed you down in getting to your goal ultimately to Diablo and Inferno. With removing that requirement and making these side dungeons bounties, we've taken everything, every nook and cranny in the game, and we can give you occasionally a good reason to go there to increase the variety. So all the side dungeons we do have can now happen in a much more varied order. So yeah, when you're in heaven and you have a few bounties to do there, we're going to make sure you see some side dungeons there, and then we're going to send you to other acts to do other things. So I think that we'll be addressing your concern really well with Adventure Mode. We have about our time. This is our last question. Uh, firstly, thank you guys for such all your hard work and for such an amazing game. Uh, my question is more on the architecture, maybe with the always on stuff with hardcore. Um, I've lost a few characters personally to just a little bit of lag spikes or hardcore just timeouts. Um, is there any architectural improvements 
possibly coming that'll help fix that. I know you guys helped with rubber banding, but can we expect anything else with it being always on and us having to be connected and possibly losing characters that way? Yeah, um, we're, we're constantly um, like looking at those situations. On, on a regular basis, gameplay programming is reviewing each and every report we get on subjects like that. QA is hammering on it. We are adding uh, server capacity in different regions. Um, you know, uh, Asia, for example, is having issues with that, especially Australian players. We're trying to address issues like that, too. So, yes, we're conscious of that, and we're doing everything we can to, to solve issues like that. All right. All right, thank you, guys. See you guys tomorrow at the panel. You're watching BlizzCon 2013, an original DirecTV 